I do remember standing in the hospital hallway before we knew, but you always kind of know, but we had like just that magical thinking where like we had just joined this thing called Instagram and he was like, take a picture, <laughs> like take a picture. So I've got like my iPhone four and I'm like taking a picture as they're closing the doors to the MRI room. And I just thought like, okay, like this is one of those moments that's a before and an after. Like it, it, whatever happens after this, like I know my life will be different. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break down the things that make us break down. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Maya Bialik's breakdown is supported by Athletic Greens. I love Athletic Greens. And the reason I started loving it was because I was tired of taking a million pills. I was. I was that person who was like, let me take my pills. <laughs> it's like in a, a duffel bag every morning. <laughs> what is Athletic Greens? Well, with one delicious scoop, you get 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. Right now, reclaim your health, arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. You don't need a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is... All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash breakdown. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash breakdown to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutrition insurance. My MBLX Breakdown is supported by EverlyWell. What if you could use science to discover more about your body all year long? Give yourself more clarity. Better understand your health and wellness with EverlyWell at-home lab tests. So here's how it works, and we're very excited. This is how it works for us. They shipped us these at-home lab tests straight to us with everything you need for a simple sample collection. There's a prepaid shipping label. You mail your test back to a certified lab, and in days, your physician-reviewed results and actionable insights are sent just to your device. I love it because it's really harnessing the power that used to only be had if you walk into a doctor's office, get an expensive referral and all this stuff. This, you can take control of your health. It comes right to you. I love it. I also, I've really gotten into like doing these at-home tests. It's also, it's fun and it works. For listeners of our show, Everly Well is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test at everlywell.com slash break. That's everlywell.com slash break for 20% off your at-home lab test. Everlywell.com slash break. We got a big one today, folks. We are going to break down grief. I mean, that's like putting it lightly. We're going to be speaking to someone who first gained notoriety from the obituary she wrote at age 31 for her husband. She wrote it with him. Before we get into more about Nora McInerney, I'd like to introduce the person whose obituary I hope to write, Jonathan Cohen. <laughs> That's good. Hi, Maya. Is it weird? I hope not today. <laughs> not today. Speaking but of, maybe. No. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Speaking, there would be no one I would want to write my obituary more than you. That's beautiful. I would want to do the punch up, though, <laughs> to make it funny. And speaking of today, this episode is being recorded on the podiversary of our release of our very first episode. Happy so, podiversary. Happy podiversary. And thanks to everyone who's uh, followed along. Here. Yeah, and listened. Especially our, our rabbit grin team. And Valerie and Scott, who's sitting right here, Jeff. And Rob. Rob. And all the editors. All the editors. Jim and Lux. Lux. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Happy Potiversary. What a perfect, perfect episode to do on our Potiversary. All about death and dying. No, it's not about death and dying. No, but it is about grief and difficult emotions. Well, okay, let, let me just, I just want to talk about, like, because it's a very interesting way in. There's this, there's this But before woman. you do that, before you do that, I, I want to say that even if you haven't lost someone yourself it, right. who is super close it's to you. It's not about that. 
this has applicability and relevance to you, even if you haven't gone through it yourself. Even if you haven't lost someone, th this is not just about how to get through if you lost someone. Let me just introduce a little bit who Nora McInerney is. So Nora has a, a, a pretty incredible, she does have an incredible TED talk. And when Jonathan was like, you have to watch this, I was like, nah. And then I watched it and it's- But that's your response to most things I suggest. Okay. Her TED talk on moving forward with grief instead of getting over, you know, grief- I like Has that. been viewed over 5 million times worldwide. Um, she has a podcast, Terrible Thanks for Asking, but she, she founded the Hot Young Widows Club is where a lot of people know her from. But she's she wrote a book literally in the six months after losing her husband. She was 31. He was, I believe, 35. Um, in addition, she lost a second pregnancy. She had a toddler and lost a second pregnancy, then her father, and then six weeks later, lost her husband. But this episode is quite funny. This e <laughs> So in her TED Talk, I mean, what, what first comes across is that she's she's a very eloquent... And, and great storyteller, and she is, she's very, very funny. Um, but she talks about some of the hardest aspects of what people expect of your feelings. And that's kind of why this episode, I think, is really for, for everybody. It's about when other people have expectations about how you should feel, how quickly you should get over it, what that looks like. And yeah, her journey is very, very special um, in, in many ways. Uh, she has since remarried, she has a blended family, very interesting story. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just very eager to talk to her and grateful for her vulnerability. And I mean, I, I had so many, I have so many things I'd love to talk to her. I kind of want to talk to her about how she talks. But for now, let's welcome Nora McInerney to The Breakdown. Break it down. You are not unfamiliar with a variety of um, aspects of breaking down, as it were. Um, one of my favorite pastimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's so much about, you know, kind of your journey that is, that is exceptional, meaning it is outside the realm of so many people's understanding. Uh, but, you know, a tremendous amount of the work that you do, which seems to obviously have started from a very, very personal journey, um, is one that you've really been able to expand out to sort of cover a variety of grief experiences without, you know, kind of some of the things that many of us often fear when we experience grief, right? That no one will understand, no one will be able to relate. And in fact, that is very true. You know, I, um, about three months after my father uh, of blessed memory died, a woman came up to me in synagogue and... <laughs> She was trying to be so nice. They're always trying to be nice. And what she said is a very banal thing. She said, I know exactly how you feel. Oh. And I know. So here we are in- Was Sin he your dad too? <laughs> so that's what that meant. So this was literally, it was, uh, there are certain services that you go to when you've lost someone. So it was a, it was a specific service for people who had lost people. Also, I'm a public person, so like everyone knew certain aspects of my father's passing and I I did choose to write about it um, a lot. And about three months is when you get that really angry irritability that comes with grief when no one can do anything right. The best part I think of grief is just <laughs> that blind, indiscriminate rage. Well, this poor sweet woman, <laughs> she, I mean, I, I kept it together, but, you know, I remember saying to myself, like, this is exactly the point of grief, is that you you absolutely, you don't know. You don't know yes. him. You didn't know him. You don't know me. That's like what was going through my head. But, you know, the, the place where you've really, you know, made this very specific mark, you know, and as you say, it's very, very niche, um, <laughs> is you've taken something that is not just your experience. Your experience in particular is even outside of the realms of what anyone, right, can imagine. You said that's what people say, like, I can't even imagine. But you really, you really have, you know, built this kind of understanding around it. And it's, you know, really your, your life's work um, has been really making something that could be the least accessible thing for so many reasons accessible. So I would like to know a little bit about you know, the years before, 
Yeah, uh, let's say oh, you, I can tell you what my life's work used to be. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, I'm super curious. So tell us, tell us where you're from. Tell us like, you know, did you have experiences with grief or anything like that when you were a kid or were you just like a normal person growing up thinking that life was going to be fine? Well, first you want to know what my nickname was growing up? Blossom. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Blossom. Yeah. <laughs> Cause guess what I love to wear, uh, that kids didn't really understand the nineties hats. Okay, sorry I wore a bowler hat to my third grade photo. Okay, sorry you rubes in Minneapolis didn't know fashion. It's called style, okay? I look like, you know, the fourth stooge. Get over it. I look cool. I felt confident. Never lived it down. Did not stop. I was like, guess what? Hats are cool. You will see them on TV. I grew up in Minneapolis. My family's Catholic. We also love funerals. Right. But I do think that, you know, growing up um, now, I realize like Jews do death best. We kind of do. I don't want to brag. My God, I'm like a yard site candle. What? <laughs> like, oh, it's so beautiful. Like sitting Shiva, like everyone else having to just shut the fuck up until you want to talk. That's right. Brilliant. Like brilliant. Yeah, we've definitely got death down. Living, not so much. Living, we're not so good at. Dying, very fuck. good. <laughs> Dying? We can talk, but I grew up Catholic. Uh, my life was, I always wanted to be a writer. And I remember telling my mom when I was a kid, like, I don't think it'll happen because like my life is too good. Like you, nothing is going to happen to me. Thanks a lot for loving my dad, you boring person. <laughs> and, you know, my parents worked in advertising, both of them. So I worked in advertising when I graduated from college and I wrote tweets for great clips for years. <laughs> and you know, put together social media strategies for, you know, an unnamed fossil fuel brand that absolutely did not be need to be on Twitter and would not believe me. They're like, I think, you know, I think we should be there. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm going to disagree. I'm going to go ahead and disagree, but you, you do you. And uh, so I just had the most boring life, truly, like nothing had happened. And I mean, aside from wearing that bowler hat, getting a bowl cut, also in third grade. So I also looked like Macaulay Culkin. That was like an unfortunate thing. But I just had a very, very charmed life that I did not realize was charmed um, until I didn't have it anymore. And I did all the stuff that, you know, you have to do in your 20s, like just go around tapping terrible men on the shoulder being like, will you love me? Mm. <laughs> um, you're the wrong guy. Could I be the right girl for you? I'll change my personality. Like, what do you like? Me too. Oh, sports. <laughs> sports and music. I same. Beer. <laughs> love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And then I met uh, this guy named Aaron and it turned out we'd followed each other on Twitter. This is such a 2010 story. <laughs> we followed each other on Twitter and I had tweeted these like Twitter was such a different place. It was so joyful. And I tweeted that I was going to be at this art show uh, to really just like sh prove how cool I was. And he was like, I'm going there tonight. And he broke through this group of friends by friends. I mean, only my first cousins, my only friends. And and was like, you're Nora McInerney. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I'm, I'm Permort. I like, we tweet, we tweeted each other. And I like, of course I knew he was coming. He had mentioned he was coming. I had like clicked on his little icon. I knew he was cute. I knew he was cute. And I, I looked through all his tweets. I was like, he loves Taylor Swift. I love Taylor Swift. I had stolen from our office the Taylor tells all <laughs> issue where it's like, they break down her lyrics and I brought it to him and I handed it to him and he like held it to himself and he kept it forever. He kept it. I still have it. Um, and we just like, you know, all the boring stories, every love story is so boring because they're all the same, right? It's like, I found him. Huh. <laughs> like, it's just that. And, and how, how got, old were you when y'all met? I was 27, which in the Midwest, it's like, you are going to die alone. Correct. My parents, right, I mean, my, that's my, well uh, beyond. <laughs> my dad's primary fear. He was like, when I was your age, I had two kids. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> oh, and uh, Aaron was 30. He was 30 or 31. I just know that he was in his 30s and that felt like huge Very, to me. I was like, yeah. I'm sorry. He's like older. He's an older man. <laughs> um, he's older. He like owned, owned a home, was the home, a tiny little shack that was like falling into the earth that he definitely should not have paid any dollars for. Yes, but it was his. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed. And it was just so easy. And we were together for a year. And then he had a seizure at work. Mm. 
And that night we found out it was a brain tumor. And then four days later, they took it out of his skull. And a month later, we were married Mm -hmm. and he had stage four brain cancer. And then, and then, and then. And I do remember standing in the hospital hallway before we knew, but you always kind of know, but we had like just that magical thinking where like we just joined this thing called Instagram and he was like, take a picture, <laughs> like take a picture. So I've got like my iPhone four and I'm like taking a picture as they're closing the doors to the MRI room. And I just thought like, okay, like this is one of those moments that's a before and an after, mm-hmm. like it, it, whatever happens after this, like, I know my life will be different. And, um, and it was, and you mentioned like everything is so personal. There is no like knowing exactly how someone feels, but I think in those moments, in those like first weeks after he had brain surgery and then got his diagnosis, like I felt simultaneously, like I'd been separated from the normal world. We were sitting in a hospital room for so long Like our world had just shrunk down. There was all this possibility. We're going to be together. We're going to get married and have babies and, you know, wear matching outfits and family photos and all of that stuff. And then we're just in this little room. But so is everyone else in this hospital. Like, so is everyone else. Like no one is here because they want to be except the people who work here and are being paid. Everyone else here is like here against their will because something terrible happened And I felt so separated from the world and also so connected to it in a way that I just hadn't had to before. Like I just, I had so much sympathy, like so much pity, I should say, for people who are going through hard things and almost no empathy because I just refused to imagine. I refused to imagine. Well, and I think that's sort of, you know, I want you to, if you don't mind, you know, I'd kind of like to go back a little bit because... You know, when you think of kind of the first year of a relationship, um, you know, I, I kind of I break things up in kind of three month, you know, phases. <laughs> I think that's kind of how a lot Quarters. of human, a lot of human cycles go that way. Yeah. So like the first three months is like it's lust and it's bliss and it's like, oh, my gosh, this is it. I mean, usually, of course, there's a whatever. And then you kind of get to like the next three months and then it's like, oh, we've been together six months. It's like half of a year. And the next anniversary is like the big one. Right. Yeah. And then like you you curve around nine months. And by then it's been someone's birthday. Some parent has had something happen. Like you've been through a couple things and you're like, wow, we made it through. Or like, I wish he would this or I wish she would that. But like you're there. And then when you come around to a year, you're like feeling if you're still liking each other and sex feels good, you're like. We made it to a year. Like the world is our oyster, right? <laughs> so then to have to have this happen, like, you know, as both a scientist and a human, I'm like, I think you were probably in shock, you oh, know, totally. for you know, for oh. a large extent also of yes. this kind of experience. My MBLX breakdown is supported by BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp wants to tackle some of the stigmas around mental health. We've been taught that taking care of our mental health like isn't part of everyday life, but that's actually a misconception. We take care of our bodies by exercising, by going to the doctor, by eating well, focusing on and investing in the health of our minds, our mental health that's just as important. Some might think you should wait until things are unbearable before they try therapy. We're here to tell you that is not truth. BetterHelp is customized online therapy. They have video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. What if you don't want to see anyone on camera, Jonathan? You don't have to. You don't have to. It's also much more affordable than in-person therapy. And you can be matched with a therapist in an incredible under 48 hours. Give it a try. See why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash break. That's Better, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. My MBLX Breakdown is supported by Relief Band. Nausea can ruin a day. It can force us to change plans. That's happened with me before. Relief Band is the number one FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband that is clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively present nausea and vomiting associated with things like motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, that's when I get my nausea, 
hangovers, morning sickness, and so much more. Relief Band works by stimulating a nerve in your wrist that travels to the part of the brain that actually is modulating nausea. This is unbelievable. I suffer from nausea specifically related to migraines, but my older son has a motion sickness. This is exactly what we need. Relief Band is a great gift. I know it sounds like a weird gift, great gift. I would love to get this as a gift. Right now they've got an exclusive offer just for Breakdown listeners. Go to reliefband.com, use the promo code BREAKDOWN, you'll get 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. Think of someone in your life who's like always getting nauseous, get them the Relief Band. Head to R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use our promo code BREAKDOWN for 20% off plus free shipping. So here's the question, and I really, there's so many people have spoken to you and you speak so beautifully and you say many incredible things, but I'm really interested in in these kinds of things and I hope you'll kind of go yeah, with us. So I will, yes. Had, had y'all talked about getting married? Oh, yes, we had. and Because you're from the round, Midwest. You talk about it on like Midwest, date three. Of course. Right. Like, and honestly, we <laughs> talked about it on date two and I'm right. not joking. Date two... <laughs> It was just, everything was so easy. It was just so annoying <laughs> and to other people. Cause I was like, God, I like him so much. And actually on our second date, you know, I did like the whole, like, so like, you know, like, have you had like recent, have you seen anyone recent? I don't know why. Like, cause I was just in that unhealthy, like, uh, let's, let's pick our scabs for each other kind of thing. I would never do that now, but, uh, he'd only had one other girlfriend and they had been together for 10 years and oh. they'd broken up weeks before we went out and I was like oh well I guess this is over because that's not gonna work like <laughs> no like of course not and then uh we went out like two days later and and we were talking and he was telling me all about his family and I have I come from a family of four he comes from just you know a family of two him and his sister and I was like well I want four kids and he was like well, I could do two and I was like well three and we shook on it and he was like if we have three kids i stay at home i was like absolutely i would never do that i would never <laughs> ever ever do that you can be a stay-at-home dad and i had just moved into his house at the one year mark my lease was up and um i hadn't told my parents because <laughs> not because oh i'm an adult and i don't care what they think because i'm afraid of what they think correct they no no think. i totally we get it like, so you had moved in yeah, I moved in like on October 30th. Got it. And then maybe a few days before October 30th was like our last normal night. He used to throw this party called Halloween <laughs> and uh, like he would DJ and it was like $5 at the door at some, you know, I was at this bowling alley, Elsie's in Northeast Minneapolis. And it was, he was the kind of person who really made like everyone feel like the party couldn't happen if they weren't, unless they were there. Mm -hmm. So when he said like, invite anyone, he really meant invite anyone and everyone he knew invited anyone. And it would be like hundreds and hundreds of people that he didn't know. And I got so drunk. I got so drunk. I puked on his car. And I puked in his car. <laughs> and I puked the whole next day. And then we went to work on, on Halloween and he had a seizure. I was just like, God, I mm. ruined our last normal weekend. Mm. <laughs> like by just laying in bed being like, I I'm going to die. I'm going to die here. This is where it goes. But yeah, we talked about getting married and, you know, and, and having kids. And I was, you know, painting the bathroom because he had painted it green screen green. Mm -hmm. Cause he thought that was funny. <laughs> and he was just, because he was funny and he was like, yes, if everyone do a green screen video in here, totally. the bathroom was like this, just like the size of a toilet. It was just like a toilet with a shower, like over. It was so small. I was like, where would you shoot a video? <laughs> like where, what, <laughs> what scenario are you planning for here? So did he have any other symptoms? I mean, like looking back. When you look back, sure. But they were all, um, I, now, now having met so many people with brain tumors, so many people with glioblastoma, um, my mother's friend's husband, um, died of glioblastoma. I actually had to reschedule my first date with Aaron to go to that funeral because mm. it was a night funeral. It was very classy. And 
his had presented like he was reading the newspaper upside down and this normally mild mannered man was rude and mean. And Aaron didn't have any of that. He was it was in a part of his brain that apparently he didn't need like the upper right. You probably know it. I mean, you <laughs> need right. all of it. But yes, okay. it was. that's a part that you didn't seem see. like a vacant part. You didn't okay. say right. it's just open for rent. Um, no, but like one that didn't cause, for example, behavioral changes or yeah, uh, personality changes, right, or visual like the stuff. Best right. place for a bad stage four brain tumor. Right. So he had headaches, but like, don't we all? And right. like, he couldn't fall asleep, but like, right? Isn't that normal when you're, you know, so in your twenties and have or thirties and have a stressful job? And and I I'm curious about this also because you know you are a writer and you have you know. Um, a different way you look at the world as as writers tend to. So um, what was that moment of getting engaged? Uh, was was it was it in a flash? Was it a like how how did it come about? We had talked about it and we we're like, we'll get married the summer after next. So that would have been the summer of 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there was no like formal anything. We'd just been talking about it and we didn't know what kind of brain tumor he had. And it was Halloween night and he had had his MRI and they had told him that there was a brain tumor and I had decided that it was benign um, or just like maybe like a conjoined twin they had forgotten about. Or it was just going to be something that would be scary and then it would be over and we would be over it. That's the bargaining stage of grief. Oh, the bargaining stage. And I was like, yeah, no, that's we can. That's totally acceptable. It'll be like such a great story. You'll have a handsome scar. Awesome. And I remember we were in this dark, dark hospital room and his mom, who I love, and who was just so sweet was like, can I stay here too? And I was like, yes, like, of course, like, can I, I'm only his girlfriend. Like, where do I fit mm -hmm. in here? And she stayed in like the chair that reclines into a twin bed. And I stayed in bed with him, which felt incredibly scandalous, <laughs> even in this situation. I was like, like <laughs> um, but in like a little hospital bed. And I remember him whispering to me, um, like, you can't marry me now mm -hmm. because I'm going to be sick. And I was like, no, you won't. And also like, no one tells me what to do except my dad. And, um, there's like the heart monitor light illuminating like his beautiful profile. He had the best nose. And I remember telling him like, you're, we're going to get married. We're going to get married as soon as you're out of here. And like, that's that. And now we're engaged. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> like, he was like, okay, but you like, you really shouldn't. And I was like, well, I'm really going to. So, hmm. There we go. And I told, we told his mom the next day. <laughs> you didn't wake her in the middle of the night? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she like heard and was like, okay. <laughs> like, but she was a flight attendant. So she literally can fall asleep anywhere with no, like, she was like, okay, yeah. Oh, it, it reclines even better. Great, luxurious. So, uh, so that was it. And we didn't have a date. He was diagnosed a few weeks later. What was the prognosis at that point? You know, we had walked in to uh, the the oncologist's office bargaining. We had walked into the oncologist's office with the belief that only an oncologist can tell you you don't have cancer. <laughs> like, truly, that is what we thought. We were like, yeah, so we just have to go there. They'll tell you it's nothing. And then we can go. We made lunch plans. So we had a place to go. We had taken the whole day off of work, which America, I love it. Greatest country in the world. I was like, can I take a whole day off? Like my boyfriend had a seizure and they took a brain tumor out of his brain. Totally no big deal if not, but it would be cool if I could go. I can come back in the afternoon, which I did. Great. Um, so we went to the oncologist's office and they told us that it was stage four glioblastoma and we had said before, no matter what, and I don't remember if Aaron said this or I said it to the doctor, but we had talked about it beforehand and we told them like, we never want to know how much time there is like ever. So even if right now you're saying like he has four days to live, we don't want to know. Like we just never, ever want to know. Um, and that's that. And we never want you to even bring it up <laughs> ever. And so they never did, but I Googled that word once on my phone 
and the first result, how you get like that little yep. preview, it says expectancy three to five years. Yep. And I remember trying to close my phone so quickly, but he saw it and he saw me see it. And then we just pretended mm-hmm. that neither of us had seen it. So you, um, you did get married. We got married. We got married one month later at the same place where we met. Wow. And when did you get pregnant? The next, I got, it's so hard. I, I, I always forget how years work. Right. <laughs> I'm like, and then, but I had a baby in January. We got married December, 2011. Ralph was born January, 2013. So you're going to have to do that math because I was an yeah, English so, major. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. So you were married less than six months, let's say. And you oh, got, for sure. yeah. And you for got, sure. yes. you got pregnant. Um, what, yeah. what was that? Through con- science. Right. Through science. Uh, okay. Like, and all this happened as it opposed had to, happen. to praying hard yeah. and asking for a yeah. virginal. Uh, got it. Yeah. As opposed to just, you know, like it, it, there was no spontaneity to it. It was like, you're going to go jerk off in a cup. Got I'm going to lay down and a nurse is going to put it in me um, and set an egg timer, a literal egg timer. So before he started chemo, there was a lag between brain surgery, diagnosis, chemo. And at the appointment where we were told he had cancer, I asked about like, is it going to be safe to have kids? Right. And they looked at me like, well, no, because he's going to be radioactive. Right. And he's going to be taking this chemo that is so dangerous that he you can't share a water glass with him. Yeah. Uh, and your toothbrushes should be in separate cups. Yeah. And you shouldn't exchange fluids. Very sexy. And I looked into immediately. He was like, well, I want to have kids. Like, what are we going to do? And we, uh, he went and froze his sperm for like a couple months. And uh, IVF was so expensive. We were both young. We had no money in the bank at all. And so we did IUI, uh-huh. which is intrauterine uh, yes. intrauterine insemination, which I literally asked the IVF doctor, I was like, do you have like a freer version? Like a che- what if you just put it in me? Is that yeah. possible? And he was like, yeah, we could. <laughs> I was like, great, then just do that one and we'll do it. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. No mm-hmm. big deal. And now we have we Ralph. Were, and now we have Ralph. And now we have Ralph. Yeah. <laughs> My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by ZipRecruiter. If you need to add more employees to your team, use ZipRecruiter. Their matching technology helps you find the right people for your roles fast. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash break. ZipRecruiter uses powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. Then it proactively presents these candidates to you and you can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job, which encourages them to apply faster. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site in the U.S. based on G2 ratings. ZipRecruiter's technology is so effective, Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. That's amazing. It saves you so much time, so much money. Find the right employees for your workplace with ZipRecruiter. Try it for free at this exclusive web address. ZipRecruiter.com slash break. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash B-R-E-A-K. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Third Love. Third Love knows comfort and fit are essential to feeling your best, which is why they designed their Kinetic Sports Bra to support you every step of the way. I'm talking to you, Jonathan. The Kinetic Sports Bra is your new best friend. Designed with unmatched comfort and support for your high-intensity workouts and casual weekend errands when you don't feel like having something on that's not a sports bra. Back closure, adjustable straps, high-performance design in an array of colors. And the thing that's amazing is that because it's third love, I know that it is something I can trust. Finding my third love bra was life-changing. Finding the right fit for me was so significant. And I do, I trust all of their products because of what an incredible experience I had just in finding the right bra for me. Feeling is believing. Upgrade to everyday pieces that love your body as much as you do. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order at thirdlove.com slash breakdown. That's 20% off at thirdlove.com slash breakdown. Were there conversations about what that would be like in terms of the decision to parent, knowing, you know, that at a certain point it, it might be not the two of you? Yeah, there were. There were. I think the 
when I think about that time in our life, people kept saying to me, like, wow, it's so good of you. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> so good of you to stay with him. Or like, oh, this has to be like, this is so brave of you. And I just think like, not really. And when I look back now, especially having Ralph is about to turn nine oh. next week, I just think, oh my God, I don't know that I could do what Aaron did for me, mm. you know? Um, and I'm so glad he got to be a dad. And we decided to go forward with it when we took our niece and nephew, his sister and her children to um, Disney World. I had never been. Aaron had been so many times he was like on a first name basis with it and called it Disney. I was like, okay, well, it's Disney World. You should <laughs> use the full name because not everyone, not everyone here like knows what all the rides are. Okay. So uh, we took them to Disney World and it was like the end of the night and every kid on the shuttle back to the hotel was like crying, losing their minds. And Aaron was holding our nephew who was also losing his mind. And he was like, I want to do this. Mm. Like, I want to do this. And, um, you think, like, you think you know what you're agreeing to. You know mm. what I mean? Like, you always do. You think you have, like, a sense of what you're doing. But you really don't, you know? Like, I, I mean, I knew I would most likely be raising Ralph without Aaron. But you can't live in that knowledge and still live. You know what I mean? Like, when people say things... Like, well, we're all going to die eventually, which people said to Aaron when he had cancer. Well, we'll probably all get cancer. It's like, okay, well, then you get it right now. Right. Like if it's so, <laughs> so easy. Well, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow. Yeah, but you don't think you will. You know, right. that's why you get out of bed. <laughs> like if you truly live believing like it could end at any moment, you wouldn't get up. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like we had to live these parallel lives where we we're like planning for the worst. Like we had a date with an estate planning attorney to plan out our, we had no money. What were we even planning for? It was like, and, and we made medical directives so that he would know what I wanted in case I was, you know, who knows what happens during birth. Like we all, we did this stuff together, but we also lived like we were just going to be like a normal couple, you know, like he was still putting money into his retirement. He was like, we were, we were making decisions about having a child, about how to raise this child as if he were going to be there forever. And I think that's so generous. And I also think it's just because we were so naive and thank God for that. I want everyone to have like the gift of not knowing, like, of, of and of not anticipating and living with this. Um, you're all like when you're already living on that ledge, like on the knife's edge where like it could just end, like any, it could just truly end. And you both know that. It really is a gift to like not be able to project that far into the future. I, I think that's what, what anxiety is. That's what worry is, like sort of trying on those feelings in advance. There's no preparing, no amount of worry, no amount of like trying to imagine what it would feel like that could prepare me for that. And Aaron was just very, very much in the present moment all the time, like just bizarrely mentally healthy. I've never met a person like him. Mm -hmm. Like I tried to explain like what depression was like to him. And he was like, Oh, Oh man. <laughs> it's like, you just feel that every day. I was like, yeah, just like <laughs> all the time. <laughs> like, I just feel like, you know, like what's the point? Should I get up? And he was like, what? <laughs> like, Oh my well, God. And I think this, this, you know, feels like an appropriate time to, yeah. to also mention that you had had a hell of a month the month before this, your October leading into, oh, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so just kind of to, to flash forward. Yeah. We just had this beautiful, normal marriage. Right. Truly. Like we really did like where I would be like, I told you to take out the trash. And I meant now, like right. I literally meant now, <laughs> come on. And like when he was dying, he was like, I'm not going to know how Game of Thrones ends. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad he doesn't. Right. Because he got to die when it was amazing. Okay. <laughs> so and the <laughs> so you 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 had Ralph. We had Ralph and you got pregnant with Yes, I got pregnant again. And when I talk about like truly being 
naive. I do think now part of it, you mentioned shock. I think I spent a lot of those years in shock and I did not know anything about trauma. I did not know anything about at no point did any medical professional say to me like, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Like, do you need something? Yes. I could have used like every Ativan that in the world that would have helped. I could have used, you know, a therapy, but when would I have gone? Like when between work and having a baby and taking care of somebody, like there was just no way uh, to do that. We decided to have another baby and it seems delusional now part of it, you know, like it really does. But I, I, I wanted Ralph to have a sibling. I wanted him to have a sibling that was, you know, Aaron's child, like mm. Aaron, we had all this extra sperm. It felt like I didn't want to waste it. <laughs> and, and, and what do you do? You know, like, is it moral to have a baby with a man who's not there anymore? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I wanted him to be there for it. I felt like Ralph had these magical powers and had like kept Aaron alive. And so would two babies keep him double alive? I don't know. But I got pregnant and it felt miraculous and it felt amazing. And it felt so sad to watch this disease progress and know that I was like growing a life while I was also watching like a life end. Um, and it was obvious, like it was obvious um, that like that tumor was growing and like clipping into other parts of his brain. So I lost that baby on um, October 3rd. And then my dad died five days later. Uh, and Aaron was like, wow, he just had to scoop me, huh? Just had to. <laughs> was your father ill? Was it sudden? Yeah, my dad was um, a Marine mm. in Vietnam. And he was exposed to many chemical agents mm. that are not good for a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old and a 19-year-old to breathe in. And uh, he had all kinds of cancer. And he told us about it in May of 2014 and he died in October. Wow. So, yeah. So that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and know, then. Like, kind of got to skip through some stuff. Well, like, no, but, uh, but then literally a, approximately yeah. six weeks later. Yeah. Um, and you, you lost Aaron. So. Yes. Yeah. So, so then you did an amazing thing in that you were very productive in your grief and you so wrote. productive. You wrote. So productive. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. Two days after Aaron died, it was Thanksgiving. And we had Thanksgiving. Just mm -hmm. insane. Just like talk about shock. Talk about just like. That's also very, very Midwestern Catholic. Like I'm uh, nothing will stop you. I mean, that's. No, no, no. We will give thanks. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> there is still much to be thankful for. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's count our blessings. What was, well, what was at least that dad dinner died like? quickly. It was the worst dinner of my life. I hated Every minute of it. I think we made the kids watch like the, and our, every, all of our kids were very little. I'm pretty sure that was the night they all watched Die Hard and we like <laughs> left the room. <laughs> like my mom was mad at me because I was just on Tumblr all night, mm -hmm. you know, like responding to 14 year old girls who were like, OMG, you're, you, you are, your husband died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm so sad. And I was like, thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks. Stay young. Being an adult is the worst. <laughs> Stay, stay 14. It does not get better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it actually gets a little worse and then maybe, maybe much worse. So, uh, that was a terrible Thanksgiving and I had been writing. I'd been writing since Aaron was sick. I've been writing my whole life mm -hmm. and Aaron was the first person I dated who ever cared about it, uh, and read my writing, even though this is, you know, this is like height of the blog era. So I was writing for all these little blogs and writing really interesting things like our leggings pants. Um, and I believe they are <laughs> to this day. I, will. I was ahead of my time because that was 2010. I was saying, yes, they're pants. Right. You don't need to, you don't need to cover it up with like a long cardigan. You can just, you can just wear them as pants. And now I disagree, what is Gen Z doing? it feels like the yeah. wrong time to have that conversation. <laughs> Um, so, so you wrote and yeah. And I guess I would like to, you know, I know it's hard to encapsulate, but because I am a, a Jewish person of the traditional variety, you know, I, I, I remember, and it's not the same. It was my father, not my, like, mm -hmm. I'm not at all comparing, but, um, you know, I did read um, Year of Magical Thinking, you know, the the Didion book, which my, um, you know, my mom and I both read. Um, 
was essentially the only book I could read. I could not read during my first year of grief. I don't know what short-circuited, but I, I couldn't even read magazines. It was very strange. But um, what I learned is that uh, while all grief is different. There are certain things that are similar. And I, things like I mentioned that like rage sets in around three months. Like I found that to be universally true of everyone I've spoken to, no matter what the loss was, that there's like, so certain things happen. You start dissociating at this month, you start, mm. you know, anyway. So what, what I, what I remember, you know, of that, of that year was that it really did take a year for something to cycle through. And I don't know if it's because like, you know, you've lived every day once without that person existing. And you know, the, the Jewish custom is very, very specific. You know, there are restrictions we have obviously for the first eight days and there are restrictions we have for the first 30 days, but then there are restrictions that carry on for an entire year, which I, I held to. So what I know is that, you know, when that year's up, you know, you you host a, a kiddish, like a little, you know, wine and cookies thing. And then, you know, something shifts. Your identity shifts. You're no longer a mourner, meaning you're no longer required to, you know, say the prayer three times a day and all those things. So, you know, obviously your first six months were very productive. <laughs> what, when, when did something shift for you where you felt okay, this was one phase and now like, I gotta like, you know, whatever it is, I have to shower more regularly. I need to parent this child more actively. Like, yeah. how long was that? So long, so long. And I think the, 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 one of America's biggest shortcomings is even if you have beautiful and useful, helpful, like transformative grief traditions, like you are so fortunate to have, um, it doesn't matter because nope. <laughs> we mostly care about productivity and you will get, I got three days off for my dad dying. The average person gets three to five business days off for bereavement leave. I did not have a job anymore. I found it impossible to read, impossible to wake up, impossible to go to bed at night, um, impossible to do anything really other than watch Bravo and rearrange my furniture in the middle of the night, take everything out of my cabinets. Uh, just another phase of grief that I found is just weirdly purchasing things that you can't afford. <laughs> like just being like, you know what I need? I'm going to need $300 worth of old Navy workout clothes. How do you spend $300 at old Navy? I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> I will show you. And I think those those traditions are so important because they signify something, right? And they signify something to the outside world that tells people, like, I am a mourner. These are the things it's, that I need a, to it's do. It's status. And we don't have that really yes. in our culture anymore. Like, what's your status? Yeah. No, it's like, let's go. Let's get out there. And uh, so I, I was productive in so many ways that were unhelpful and in so many ways that really represent... Uh, the financial reality that I was in, which is we, Aaron did not have life insurance outside of like the nominal amount that you get by just being employed. I was no longer employed because I couldn't go to work and then they didn't want to pay me. And you had a toddler. Yeah. And I had a toddler and, you know, there'd been this, you know, sort of GoFundMe thing that was set up and I was so ashamed of it, mm. like so ashamed to have needed it that I paid off Aaron's medical bills and I paid for the funeral. And then I just would get wasted at night and give the money away because mm -hmm. I would go through and see people who, whose communities couldn't raise $500, who mm -hmm. couldn't do, you know, whatever. And I started to do all of these things, start, you know, started a, a, an organization that gave money to people who didn't have it in, in tragedy, started a, 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 a widow's group because I was forced to meet this woman whose husband had also died, who I didn't want to meet. And now she is one of my best friends, Mo. And uh, I, I wrote my first book in the six months after Aaron died. And I got that book deal because... She's my kind of depressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, let me... I, I will do anything to not feel. Yeah. Emotions can't hit a moving target. They cannot. And I truly, like, I thought I was a genius. I thought one year it will expire. I will no longer be a mourner. So if I just stay as busy as possible. It'll be like it never happened. 
It'll be like it never happened. I will be the smartest person ever. I will never have to get super sad. I will never have to get my sad on other people. Yep. And, um, you know, Aaron and I had written his obituary together. I don't know if you knew that. So his obituary went viral, like 2014 viral. And the woman who would become my agent had reached out to me and said, (laughs) someday you should write a book. Um, and if you ever want to, we can talk. And I literally emailed her like maybe a day after his funeral. I was like, yeah, I'll write a book. I'll do it now. And I wanted to do it in that moment because people kept handing me books and all these books, one, I could not read, but two, they were all like told from this, like really like safe distance, Mm -hmm. like 10 years later, 20 years later, like, oh, this is what it means. And I was like, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I I mean, obviously, I, I didn't write a book, but it, it was actually something that my book agent asked me to do. He specifically asked me to compile my essays on grief specifically for that reason, because like I I I, I mean, I did. I writing in the moment of grief is very, 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 very different. And when I read them now, when I read my essays, I'm like. Who was that person? Like, it's very, very strange. So what, so you, so was that kind of, did you feel like a year was like, oh, a shift? Almost a year to the day that Aaron entered hospice. I could feel that grief in my body. My neck and shoulders are locked up. I'm like completely unhinged. I'm rage tweeting. My friend Mo was like, um, you, you should come over. I know you're having a hard time. Like I couldn't like move my neck and shoulders. Like everything was so tight. I'm all over the place. She's like, come over and burn things. I love fire. Ugh. I brought a bag of like those. This is not a bill from like, I'm like, why would you send it if it's not a bill? Why so you, would you can burn like it a, when you're in grief. Right. They're like, it's a pre bill. So like just anticipate like this is what you'll like. This is not a bill. But if we wanted it to be this is to make you mad enough. So when the bill yes. comes, you pretend it didn't come. Like if it was a bill, it would ruin you. Okay. <laughs> Cause, um, this brain surgery costs more than your house is worth you loser. <laughs> so I burned all those things. And then the side gate opened and this guy showed up and I was like, Oh God, and I have to pretend to care about like whoever this person is. And he, um, is just basically sat there all night and listened to Mo and was I talked about our dead husbands. It was my husband. It was yeah. <laughs> It's Matthew. And I was like, after a couple hours, I was like, what is your deal? Like, is your wife dead? Like what, like what brings you here? And he was like, oh no, I'm divorced. And I truly was like, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Mm. Like someone stopped loving you and I don't know how you're still alive. <laughs> like I would die. I would die. And he was like, oh, no one's put it to me that way. I was like, yeah, she just decided not to love you anymore. That's crazy. That is crazy. Your life is horrible. <laughs> Like, and you have kids and you had to explain that to them. Like he was just like, whoa, okay. Um, That's also a little bit of like, if we look so hard at you, we don't have to look at me. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, yeah. It's like, it's like, I could, I, you know, the thing, the difference with Matthew and so many other observers is like, I knew he didn't feel bad for me. Mm-hmm. Like I knew he was just interested and he was curious and he wasn't judgmental. And Mo and I were saying crazy things, <laughs> crazy things, crazy things. And he was like, mm, just listening, listening, so quiet, so handsome. And I went home and I found him on Facebook and I sent him a message and I told him to ask me out. <laughs> and, and a year to the day of Aaron entering hospice, I, I that's when Matthew could go out. Matthew was like, I have Wednesdays free. That's the only day I don't have my kids. And I was like, okay, we'll go out on Wednesday. And I had had this moment where I was like, this is the day that Aaron went into hospice. And it always will be. And it can also be something else. And so I went out to dinner with him and we just talked for hours and hours and it happened so similarly to how it happened with Aaron in that it was just easy and I didn't have to ever wonder. Uh, I, I didn't have to ever have to think like, oh, am I texting him too much or not enough? But the presence of Matthew truly made, like made my grief hit. Do you know why that is? I think just his, like one, his physical presence. I would not had... Uh, like a man around (laughs) and 
like his presence, his aliveness, knowing that there would be more with this person or maybe another person, but there would be no more with Aaron. It's like knowing there would be more possibly with Matthew made it more real that there would be no more with Aaron. Matthew's like, he was just a, he was such a safe place to be. And so many people aren't. And I remember one of the first, uh, first few times we hung out, like I couldn't get a babysitter. Ralph was in bed. Uh, and so Matthew came over and I was on the floor reading, um, Mary Oliver's Felicity, this mm -hmm. book of poems she wrote after her partner, like her lifelong partner died sobbing <laughs> on the floor, <laughs> like reading him these poems. And he was like, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. Like, do you want me to like rub your back and you can just like cry? And I was like, yeah, I do. That's exactly what I want. And, um, I, I didn't have like, I didn't, I don't want to say I didn't have the safety, but kind of like, I didn't have a place to just do that and feel that, um, because I was afraid to show people who had known me for so long, like how much it hurt. Mm. Um, and I thought if I showed them that, then that would be all they could see. Mm. And they would never see me any, any other way. And they would just feel bad for me. And I didn't want anyone's pity. I didn't want to just be like this sad story, which I could kind of sense that like, it was just a sad story for people to repeat, you know? Um, and I didn't want that. And it wasn't, it was sad to Matthew, but um, he didn't have the the burden of having known every previous version of me, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. And what would you say, you know, obviously there's, there's going to be a lot of people who, you know, who hear this conversation and may not relate specifically, but I, I think that um, it might be helpful maybe for you to tell us sort of what things most kind of moved you forward. Um, you know, you talk a lot about, uh, and we do as well, like we don't really get over things. We get through them, you know, uh, but they, they don't, you know, it, it's kind of like grief shifts, but it doesn't really go away. Like it's a thing, yeah. like I still have these moments where it's like, oh, I gotta call my guy, my dad, I gotta tell him that thing. And like, <gasps> like literally, like that's still, and it's been, you know, years. Yeah. Um, and there, there's still that like weird notion of like, I didn't get to know this, or I didn't get to go there emotionally, you know, like all those things. But what I'm, I'm curious if you can share sort of what, what has, you know, been enduring. Meaning, like, are you a, you know, are you a therapy person? Are you a meditation person? Are you a get up, get out there person? You know, was writing, you know, essentially for you an anchor? Like, what, what has helped? Because a lot of people get into a grief paralysis, and it's very, very hard to get out of it, um, or to move through it. Yeah, you know what I see more more often is what you and I do, which is like this frenetic need to try to alchemize it into something else, to try to use it for self-improvement. Oh, I'm going to help you. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to do this thing. I tell everybody like, what if you didn't? Like, what if you didn't? You don't have to. You don't have to. Every person who's lost like a child or a husband or a, a, a parent to some horrible disease is like, I need to start a thing to keep their memory alive out in the world forever. No, you don't. No, you don't. And people live inside of you. They live in like the stories you tell. And uh, I, I spent so much of that time and I don't, I don't regret it. Right. I don't regret the things like I did. I think they were like helpful until they weren't anymore. But I also look back at those years and I think, oh my gosh, that is a person who's just like, who's just too afraid to be with it. And the only thing that has helped is actually being with it and actually allowing myself to uh, fall apart. I didn't also have like the luxury of, of, of being able to, <laughs> and most people don't like most people have like sure. no safety net. And so I don't think that you're stuck if you are still sad years later but I do think, you know, my mom's friend, the one who had lost her husband, had said to me when Aaron uh, died, she sent me an email. <laughs> I love boomers. <laughs> sent me an email from her work email. 
like, and it's like, um, I believe we have a sacred responsibility to live fully in the face of our losses. Next line. It's a bitch though. That's the whole email. That's the whole email. I was like, yes, that is it. Like you do have this sacred responsibility to live fully, but living fully does not mean, you know, uh, accomplishing and like performing and, and trying to do things like living fully is so much smaller and, and quieter. And it, 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 for me has meant that I got married and I blended a family, but it has also meant, um, that I try to like actually enjoy my life, which for a long time, I think a lot of those things that I was doing was me trying to prove that like I still deserved to be alive because Aaron was so young. He was 35 and he was so kind and everybody loved him and I'm kind of an asshole. And I just wanted to like, uh, earn it, right? Like I wanted to earn my survival over his and you don't have to do that. But the things that have been enduring for me are, um, I've, I've, I've gone in and out of therapy. Sometimes I think maybe we have like too much therapy. Um, or like sometimes I think you could just like, it's a whole different That's topic. also very um, Midwestern of you. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like you know, do we just, really need to talk about feelings it? until we get through do them? We need, do we need it? Do we need it? I eventually, just they'll think, just you know, shift. Eventually, they'll yeah, just go they away. Could just go. <laughs> they could just go. I literally, in my first book, wrote a chapter that, about how I didn't need therapy because what were they going to tell me that I'm sad? What? No. Like, I, I absolutely did. I had PTSD. I was like, yeah. oh, is it not normal to, like, flash back to your husband's, like, skeletal face <laughs> or, like, uh, be looking at a, a live man who's around his age and watch him die in front? Is that weird? Is that? <laughs> I just thought normal. that's what... People did. It's very cinematic. So I don't. I was also going to mention, though, that, you know, one of the things most recommended is to go, you know, to obviously um, grief groups, but mm -hmm. especially for for for, you know, people who lose someone who are not in the, quote, normal demographic yes. of when we typically like, it's a very, very hard hard thing to kind of break into. You know, I've heard, I think it was Moshe Kashler who described what it was like to get sober when he was 15 in a room full of like 40 and 50 year old dudes. Like it's, you, you do, you need to have some, some peer experience, you know, that's specific. And so I do want to, you know, mention that like, it's, it's extremely significant and important to acknowledge that while all grief has things in common, yeah, it's, it is, it's exceptionally specific. The writer Laura McCowan, who's also a sobriety person, mm -hmm. had said one stranger who understands you completely can do what, you know, all the friends and family yep. in the world cannot. Like right. that is the necessary palliative for for change. And I did not want to be friends with any widows. Like I did not want that to be my identity at all. I was forced into it and I'm so glad for it. And what endures is not the formal organization, but so many of those relationships and I can open up my DMs, get an email. Um, I get a message at least once a day from a fresh widow and I feel that connection to them. Like it really is like it is a a siblinghood of 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 people who have experienced that that kind of loss. And Mo is still the person that I call. You know, she came to uh when I was pregnant with the baby that I uh, had with Matthew, there he is, wait, there he is. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought that I was miscarrying again and she took me to the hospital. Like she's the person that I called um, to go with me. And those are, those are things that, um, yeah, those relationships are very enduring. And so are the, the relationships that I have with people who loved Aaron. And I think I am really lucky. Not everybody gets that. Sometimes a family just falls apart when, you know, the, the hub to the wheel dies. And I'm so glad to have, I had lunch with Aaron's mom today and uh, she and Matthew's mom are taking all the kids to a movie on Monday because they don't have school. I'm very lucky for that. I'm very, very lucky Well, and for I that. think also, you know, when I, especially when I, obviously I have uh, teenagers, I have a, a 13 year old and a 16 year old. Um, but, you know, also I, I, I get to interact with a lot of Y younger people, I, you know, have spoken for lots of young people all over the, the country and such. And, you know, in particular, when I hear people talk about like 
you know, um, heartache, you know, in their teen years or, you know, when I think back to being, I, I didn't find any point to dating in junior high or high school anyway. I mean, I don't think anybody found a point in dating <laughs> me either. But the the notion that I'm trying to get to is that like true adult relationships often do come from sharing really, really deep, really emotional, really intellectual kind of things. And while it's important to have all different kinds of friends and friends that you have light time with and friends that you like go get drinks with and like you laugh, you go to clubs with, like, oh, all that fun stuff. When it comes down to it, the relationships that will kind of see you through are ones that often involve a real connecting of deep and important information, whether that's oh, we shared someone we lost or we have that kind of connection. Like, so when I hear young people who are like, but I love him so much. And it's like, well, live a little bit, <laughs> you know, have a little bit of life before we decide we, you know, can't move on from this particular situation. I, here's an awkward question. Yeah. Where's God for you? Do, did you Where's have a God? relation? Yes. Oh, Meaning, did you God. have a relationship? Because, you know, a lot of people yeah. wonder like, you know, what? Mm -hmm. like this could rock anybody's faith in anything yeah. in the universe. And you don't have to have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. But I, I am curious. You were raised Catholic. And sometimes that means mm -hmm. that you don't want to, you know, have associations. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. I also don't know if you had a any, any sort of religious, spiritual, mystical notion of yeah. what this transition, you know, for Aaron was mm -hmm. or could be. Yeah, I was raised Catholic. I, like most of us, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm like Catholic in a way. Like I will go when my parents ask me to go. <laughs> and um, my dad was very Catholic and Aaron was there with us um, when the priest came and they renamed it. They keep renaming things, I think, so they know who like, you know, is a fair weather friend and like who's really <laughs> up on it. They change all the responses and I was like, oh, I knew it. I knew it. Um, and so they don't call it last rites anymore, but I think they should because that's more beautiful. So the priest came to do last rites and it was my siblings and my mom and Aaron standing around uh, my dad's bed. And it was so beautiful. And we said, the same prayers that, you know, my dad would say to us when we were with us when we were little to put us to bed. And I hadn't said them in a long time. And Aaron um, had this tank top that he liked to wear that said Satan in rainbow colors. <laughs> and um, he was just not raised religious. He just didn't take anything that seriously. And we left there and Aaron's the left side of Aaron's body was no longer working. He had a sling. He couldn't lift our child. He couldn't drive a car. And I remember uh, that night before we watched Game of Thrones, um, he said, I don't know what that was, but it was so beautiful. And please make sure I have that. And, uh, and we did that for him. Same priest. Um, you know, they don't like check your membership card or anything. They'll just show up. And, uh, and it was like Aaron's mom and my siblings then. It was so beautiful. And I was the only person there when Aaron died. And I felt like, at least for a brief moment, I could see through this little keyhole. And like, I got it, you know, like why we're all here and like what it all means and how holy it is to exist and how beautiful it is to, to be with someone when it all ends. Um, and that was, I think the closest to God that I will ever feel besides giving birth is being present for his death. And, um, I have, when Aaron was sick, I could not have believed less in a God. Mm -hmm. I was like, cool. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I was just sure um, that it had just been so dumb. All of that, all of that effort as a child and an adolescent and 
I think now I see, I see God in people and in the way people can show up for us um, more than I do in, you know, a specific institution or a specific structure. But I will say that uh, the smell of incense um, and, uh, and a Hail Mary will always just, oof, that'll always do it for me. <laughs> hmm. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you know, specifically, I think it, it is, I think it's important also, there's such, um, you know, there's, there's, there's such a variety of reactions to, you know, to, to sickness. I mean, there's a variety of reactions to just existing every day in our healthy bodies. <laughs> Um, but I think especially, you know, if people are raised with this notion of if you do these things, things will be good for you. It can be very, very difficult when uh, life, you know, happens. And and I think the notion also of like everything's for the best, like that doesn't always feel so, you know, it doesn't really always fit, which is another no. thing that people, I'm, you know, I'm sure said to you at some point. And mostly it's people don't know what to say. Like I, I, no. I really give most yeah. people the benefit of the doubt when trying to. Um, you know, interact surrounding grief. Um, and I think the worst thing, I mean, I can forgive all the dumb things people said to me. I mean, at the funeral, more than one person was like, you're still beautiful. Oh. Like you can, you can still find someone. I'm like, oh, like tonight, like what is like, what are you, is it you? What's going on? Uh, or like, oh my God, have you lost weight? It's like, yeah, I have. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm extremely stressed out. I'm six feet tall. In no way should I be a size four. Yeah, I've lost weight. Thank you. Like, well, it looks great. I'm like, thank you. Right. You should Again, have more death boomers, around you. Boomers so that you can love ride. a thin woman. They're like, tell me, <laughs> oh, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? Oh, you just didn't eat? I yeah. love it. Oh, God. <laughs> Good for you. Um, so you um you you did. You you married Matthew. I married, I married that guy from the backyard. You have Ralph mm -hmm. and he has children from, uh, his previous marriage relationship. So there's four, there's four, there's four. We had a baby one year after that first date. Wow. 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 So he, he had two, you had Ralph. I see. So we truly blended. We truly blended. And and what is your life generally like now? I mean, obviously that's a very very full house. Um, it's a very full. I know it's like one of the the oldest just moved into his first apartment. Wow! And the youngest just learned how to ride a bike. It's like we just have a very big spread of humanity, and I do think that it's like really easy to be like, oh, like what a happy ending. And also, and this kind of gets back to the comparison stuff too. You know, where people are like, oh God, I'd rather. Oh, would I rather date a widow or would I rather date someone who's divorced? You know, like, uh, or like, isn't he jealous? Isn't Matthew jealous? I'm like, yeah, he can't wait to be dead. What are you talking right. about? What is he jealous of? Um, but, you know, you can't have a blended family unless two other families have been destroyed. Like, and so all of our kids, except for baby, like know what loss is. And they know what trauma is. And I want so badly for my life's work to be making sure that they know that your current happiness or your future happiness does not, you know, eliminate any suffering, that your suffering does not preclude you from ever experiencing happiness again, that you are allowed to love what you had and love what you have, and that those things do not need to be you know, at odds with each other. I mean, other. I think adults need to hear that. <laughs> adults need that. Like, it's true. It's like, I, I, I'm I, always so surprised at the number of widows I meet who are like, oh, no, I just cannot find a guy who can like handle like my dead husband. I'm like, what does he want to fight him? Like, what's <laughs> like, what's the and and like, this is, you know, a family portrait of me and Aaron and Ralph. And then that's a I can't. It's, you're doing great. <laughs> this, this is, you know, it's like we have photos of like all of our family, like up on one wall because it's all like, it's all fine. It's all, it's all fine. And it does not need to be uh, a, a competition and it doesn't need to be that way. I don't know. It's a, people are so, and I think I was like this too, like on that second date when I was like, oh, you had a girlfriend before and you just broke up with her. Ick, never. You could, we could never be in love. It's like, 
why not? Like, why not? Like, we are all like the sum of all of our experiences. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. You're never going to find a person who is tabula rasa. And if you do, that is a red flag. (laughs) Divorce, obviously, is a different kind of, you know, um, it's a different kind of grieving. You know, it's like the lowercase g. Um, But but also, I think that's something really important that you point out, because also you you feel like, gosh, well, this happened to my kid or my kids. So now I need to try and avoid anything that even makes them feel negative. And I mean, I think so many of us fall into that. It's like we put a lot of it's projecting also, you know, it's putting a lot of like, oh, here's grief. I can feed with candy. Here's grief. I can take to Disney World. Right. Like this grief. I can dress up nice. Right. And um yeah, I remember that was like one of my first, not mistakes, but questions, you know, when we got divorced, like I said to the, to our, our family therapist, I'm like, well, what if he wants to like see his, and we, she's like, no, you don't have to call every time. You don't have to write a letter. You don't have to be able to produce the image of your ex who might be at work or whatever. Sometimes you just have to sit in shitty feelings. Like <laughs> it's like a terrible lesson. It's terrible for adults to do, you know, which is why we drink and do drugs. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and and like keep so many therapists employed like yeah. and we do this for our kids so that the next generation of right. mental health professionals have job security right okay it's <laughs> like <laughs> but yeah we want i don't know we all we're built to we're built for comfort right like we're not built to be like god how can i like just step into this and right. like feel as bad as possible well, look, we're, we're built for sur- we're built for survival you know and and exceptional things happen to humans when we exist um and you know we also we don't grow up typically anymore in ways that put us in touch with nature life cycles like we're we're just we're very you know removed from that we have a very um you know pristine image of what we'd like um and you know the media delivers it to us for sure yeah i didn't know like when aaron died i was like do i have to call do i have to get him out of here like now like it felt like like I have a, I have a, I have a crime scene or something right. and I need to, and it's like, no, he could have stayed for like oh, hours. Like right. we could have taken our time, but I just didn't know. Sure. And I do think, you know, uh, I never saw a death. I never saw like grief really up close. And I do think it's helpful for kids they can, they can, uh, they are attuned to how adults feel. Oh yeah. You think you're hiding it. They can you're tell. You're bad. You're a bad actor. You're always okay, a bad you actor can't do with it. your children. Yeah. Your kids are like, I'm not buying it. Really? Things are good. And you're like, things are so good yeah, that my mascara know. is on my chin. Uh, Cause that's how I like to wear it. So thank you <laughs> for that. Uh, kids know, they know. Yeah. And it's scarier for them when we act like it's not a thing. When a child's internal reality does not match the external reality, it feels like they, they if it makes you feel crazy as a child and kids don't really know how to process, I feel crazy. And what it looks like is I don't trust my feelings or yours. And you get all sorts of defenses and all the things that Jonathan and I love to talk about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Nora, it's really, really a pleasure to talk to you. We really appreciate your your honesty and your vulnerability. And just so I can get this right, your first book was It's Okay to Laugh, Crying is Cool Too. Yes. Then we have the second memoir, as it were, No yeah. Happy Endings, which is yeah. about sort of the happy ending, which everyone's like, yeah. oh, look, you figured it out. Yeah. Everything's fine. <laughs> um, and then there, there is a Hot Young Widows Club yeah, book. Yeah, that's the TED book. Yep. There's also a bad mom's book, which is there's a bad mom's book. I actually that didn't came even up, realize that, and that's uh, super yeah, nobody awesome. Nobody does it. Uh, I love that so much. The guys who wrote the movie, I think, like the studio got a book deal, and they're like, "Will you write this book?" Yeah, like, we it don't says know how to write a, book. a hilarious and heartfelt book yeah. <laughs> based on the movie. Yeah, yeah, that put and you I into labor to, in 2016. It put me into labor, and I love, I love that movie, and I love the guys who wrote it. They're so kind so and fun. generous. It was supposed to be a ghost, right? And then they were like, no, you wrote it. Put I your love name it. on it. Okay, but then we yeah. have a new book. Then we have a new book. And tell us briefly, what's yes. that one? So Bad Vibes Only is essays about, uh, funny essays about hard things uh, in, in modern living, like parenting and your children's privacy and growing up as a millennial in the tackiest 
generation. Um, it's not our fault. Just like the tackiest era of media that was just hell bent on giving us all eating disorders. And then now having Gen Z be like, um, actually it's body neutrality and being like, we're working on it. Okay. We're working on it. Your mom didn't give you snack wheels cookies. Okay. <laughs> like your mom didn't give you like hundred calorie packs in your lunch. All right. So just give us a minute. We're, we're trying. Thank you, Nora, and um, we look forward to seeing what what uh, what you write for us next. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> when I asked her that question, what did I say? How did I say it? You said, "Do you?" First of all, you started with "Do you know?" And anytime Mayim says, "Do you know something?" <laughs> She's not asking because she's curious what you think. She has an entire thesis written out okay. that she wants to explain so to you, but she just wants to warm. So what, what did I say? You want? She just wants to warm you up enough to get that in. What did, What did I say? I said, "Do you know what what it what?" Well, because she said she finally felt. She finally felt grief when Matthew was around. It made it hit. I think she said, and you said something to the effect of, do you I'm know- I'm making my jello pudding pop face. <laughs> <laughs> do you know why having Matthew around made it hit? Finally. She, she, she had a very good attempt at an explanation. She was like, I have having a man around and- Well, she said it reminded her of all the things that, that Aaron wouldn't experience. And also sometimes having someone else around is a grounding force. It helps us sort of not just cycle in our own little world. You wanna know what I think? <laughs> Yes, I do want to know. Well, so one of the one of the funny things about grief is grief bleeds into every emotion. Yep. And specifically, you know, in that more acute phase, you know, for me, for sure, in that first year, um, you know how like when you see a commercial that like makes you sad or, you know, it's like that, but times a million when you've lost someone, especially someone, you know, very close to you. So what happens is it's a, you know, there's a certain conservation that the brain has. And when you feel other things, grief feeds in. So if it's not so much that like, oh, I, I'll never feel joy again. It's that physiologically and neurologically in that acute phase of grief, Every emotion, like love, feels like guilt and death and grief, meaning it's like a all roads lead to grief. And what it is is it's it's partially protective. Well, she had been not feeling anything. Correct. So she had been like this Correct. sort of well, she had she had been feeling other things. I mean, she was d trying to distract Correct. enormously. So it, as soon as she slows down enough, well, and also starts f feeling the other things the body can feel, it's that reminder of like, oh, but the overwhelming feeling is grief. That's yeah. how deep it is. Maybe that's the Ask Mayim anything. Why did Matthew make it hit? <laughs> <laughs> she also said that she didn't want to have people see her like that and just feel bad for her. And that if they saw her break down like that, they wouldn't see her any other way. And there's this notion that we can't be sad, broken around other people. They're like, how right. many times do you say it's going to be OK? Well. It's only gonna. It's only gonna be okay if it's you're allowed to not well, actually, be okay for a while. Jonathan, maybe you could speak to this a little bit because um, you have a very specific reaction just when you're sad. Sometimes when you're deeply sad, I cannot say the right thing. No, you can't. Like I, like I literally, I, I. We had to have a talk about we it. We did have to have a talk about it. But maybe do, do you want to speak to it a little bit? And everybody's gonna be different. Like you know, a lot of people say like. Oh, I don't really want to, I don't really need to like bore you with the details about my dead. Pr I will bore you with it. Like, I will tell you about every freckle on my dad's face. I'll tell you. You like, made a movie I, about it. I, <laughs> I did. I made a movie about dad's dying. No, but I'm saying like, everybody's got a different thing, you know? And, and also like the, the Jewish grief that I come from, people were like, he wouldn't want you to be sad. I'm like, oh, well, you clearly didn't know my father. He would <laughs> want me to make a movie about it throw my body into the grave with my mother, cover ourselves up. Like everybody's got Dig different- out just to just to claim your space. Screaming a mess, a mess. But you have a very different kind of emotional processing I have experienced than I do. So what what is it when you're deep? And I don't just mean like, oh, I'm sad. I, like when you're experiencing something deep, what is it? 
I, for a very long time, had a very difficult time accessing grief. For yourself? For myself. Okay. So I would not want to feel sad. If I felt sad, I couldn't let myself cry. Right. So then when I actually would access it, and if I felt safe enough around someone, it wouldn't take me years often to feel safe around. And there's only a selective group of people on this earth that I will sort of go there with. It's a weird club. Very small and exclusive club. No one wants to be a part of it. But when I do allow myself or I'm able to, I say, because uh, it's not really, I don't really feel like I have a choice if I'm. Okay. So if, if I'm able to get to that place, I can be distracted. What? <laughs> So I can't just like open the floodgates and go there. So if someone's like, if I feel like I'm imposing on that person, if I feel like they're like, shh, it's going to be okay. And I'm like, <laughs> be quiet. It's not going to be okay. And then it will like pull me out of this, like, cause I'm trying to ride this you know wave what it reminds of emotion. Me of? You know, when you're like drunk or stoned or whatever, and like some, some, some real shit happens, like there's a car accident you just or get sober, and really all good. of a sudden you're sober. That's yeah. what it is. It's like, you're in grief. But if anything disturbs it, you're like, now I can't feel my grief and it's your fault. Yeah, I get grief constipated. <laughs> and it's grief stipated. Grief stipated, exactly. Uh, but no, it's a real thing. And like if someone touches me too much and they're like <laughs> yes. trying to comfort me, and I'm like, no, get away. It's not about you comforting me. I just need to feel my thing. And I just need you to pause. Right. And just exist for a moment okay. without distracting me. Well, and I think also, you know, to kind of bring it back to you know, to what Nora was talking about, like, it sounds like there was a lot of distraction that she did, which, you know, I didn't want to like poke at her life any more than she let me. I wanted to ask, and I don't know how so she does this. So afraid of what you're going to say. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> how does she not look at Matthew and think at any moment something's wrong with him? Oh, you know, I, I did. I I almost asked that, but I I do feel... Like the the process she's been through sounds like it has truly brought her to a place of kind of being present, um, meaning like literally doing what's in front of her. You know, I think having another child uh, was probably a really, really, you know, huge transformative shift and kind of, yeah. you know, kind of creating that family. Um, but and I actually thought of you when I thought of asking her that because you know, again, and this is something we lean on a lot here, there's a tremendous variability, you know, to people's tolerance, to people's processing. And even the fact that like, and I, I wasn't really, you know, like to say it's very Midwestern to be like, mm, how much therapy do we need, right? Um, everybody's going to kind of have a different, you know, path and way around it. And you and I are much more like sit in that melancholy kind of zone, you know, really deeply like, feel it to a place that it marinates. Like, I'm a real marinator, you know? You're Sunshine I mean, Roses? I'm sorry, did, did I, am I just meeting you? I don't know how I would be now. I mean, the biggest grief I experienced, I was a kid for, and at that time, I think there was an enormous amount of shock I can relate to. And then the other component was just like, I just shoved it all away. Right, but I mean, just even with general emotion, like she seems like a person, is what I'm saying, who who naturally, you know, has an ability to to move through things, you know, in a way that I was not gifted with. She's you know, a for... faster emotional metabolism. <laughs> She's just different, you know, just different. Every everybody's different. And different is okay. Different is okay. Um, all right. For those of you who are not following us on Instagram, please go to at Bialik Breakdown. Make sure you subscribe. You can subscribe on the YouTube channel, uh, listen to us anywhere that you get podcasts. If you'd like to watch us, though, definitely go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, hit the little bell icon, ding, so you can get notifications. And go to BialikBreakdown.com. If you want to ask me anything, you can submit a question there, B-I-A-L-I-K. Breakdown.com. That's it. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, we'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down.